do through him today in Jesus' name. Brother Marty. Thank you, Pastor. Have your way. God bless you. Have God's way. Well, if you're happy and you know it, shout amen. Give somebody a hug or handshake. You can be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, we're so happy to be with you. Thank you for coming out this morning. Beautiful day, no rain, amen, glory to God. Every time we come here, we feel like we're just with our family. We've known many of you through the years, and uh, if we don't know you, we'll be happy to shake your hand, give you a hug, and say hello to you, amen. Uh, We've got some things out there at the table that might be of interest to you. Uh, We've got DVD and also CD. This is called Two Things You Should Know About the Holy Spirit. Of course, the first is how to be successfully led by the Spirit. How many of you know the leading of the Spirit is not necessarily a sentence as much as it is a sense? So we talk to you about how to target your divine cues so you're in the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right thing. And then the second is how to stay filled with the presence of God at all times. How many of you know we're not dating God? We don't pick Him up on Sunday morning and drop Him off on Sunday night, right? We're married to him, so there's a way to stay in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. This DVD is called The Fifth Element. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter gives us uh, eight essential ingredients for successful Christian living. The fifth one is uh, what we would call patience or endurance, staying the course. Then we've got some great uh, CDs. This is called Amazing Grace. It's a teaching CD. Uh, Basically, we talk about the fact that there's not only a grace uh, whereby we were saved, But there's also a grace wherein we stand, one in which we live, God's ability working in us and for us that which we could never accomplish within the power of our own human resources. So we talk about how to receive that. And then this is some great music, Uh, Look What the Lord Has Done. Uh, You know, I traveled 11 years with the uh, Rama Singers and Band. Now, we do have a disclaimer on this. It says, please do not listen to while driving. You might get happy like my brother up here and take your hands off the wheel, amen? But it's out there. Who would like this? Right over here, brother. And then we've got uh, uh, some music that we used on Friday evening to kind of pray with. This is called In His Presence. Uh, Man, it's just beautiful, instrumental, you know. You can get in the presence of the Lord with that, strings and piano. This is called Fulfilling Your Divine Destiny. And we just give you some keys to, you know, making sure you stay on the path. All right? How many of you have your Bibles? Wave them, make the devil mad. Glory to God. Listen, we we understand that people are uh, at different stages of life. We're all experiencing various scenarios of life. And so uh, we understand that At certain times, you might be on the mountaintop, man shouting the victory, and other times, uh, you might be going through some things. You know what I'm saying? So we're all at different places at different times, but how many of you know God wants to encourage people when they need encouragement? And sometimes, He'll just gear an entire service just to encourage a few because He loves His kids. So if you don't need what I'm sharing with you this morning, you just put it in your back pocket uh, because uh, there'll come a time where you will need it. (laughs) You can pull it out. But I know this morning that we're specifically speaking to uh, some of you, and we pray that you'll be encouraged by the Word of God. Let's begin in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. We'll read through verse 7. The apostle Peter, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So, of course, Peter begins by celebrating the fact that 
all of us in this room who have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We have, as the King James says, been begotten or born of God. And because we've been born of God quite naturally, we have become the sons and the daughters of God. And as sons and daughters, we have uh, become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And as an heir, we have received an inheritance, one that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved for us in heaven. He goes on to say, while we're here in the earth, we're kept by the power of God through faith. And he said, in all of these realities, we can greatly rejoice. And how many of us can rejoice in those realities? Absolutely. We can sing about it, dance about it, and shout about it because they are realities. But then, of course, he goes on to give us insight into a further reality. And that is, as long as we live in this world, in a world that is in a state of degeneration, in the world that has the presence of Satan, sin, human will, and volition, he said our faith is going to be tried. And the genuineness of our faith is going to be revealed. The reality is in this life, friends, there will be opposition. There will be adversity, and it comes in many forms. You say, well, why? Well, primarily uh, because we have an enemy, and it is his intention and seemingly uh, uh, his delight. As John chapter 10 and verse 10 says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So anything that steals kills or destroys or has those characteristics ultimately come from uh, the enemy called Satan. Amen? So we understand in life there's going to be opposition. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, and boys, you keep up with me on those scriptures now. 1, John cha uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, notice what he said. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. Uh, one translation says, don't be surprised by the fiery trial that you're passing through as though this were some abnormal experience. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, because we understand our authority in Christ, we understand the, uh, the power of Jesus' name, we understand our redemption and the redemptive rights that come. And yet we can find ourselves at times in challenging situations. And, you know, if you're like me, you're somewhat introspective. I'm, and I, I tend to analyze my actions, my responses, my motives, and so forth. And sometimes when we're facing situations, we can ask ourselves, man, I wonder where I missed it. Now, we understand we can make poor decisions or perhaps miss a certain turn, but the reality is most often you haven't missed it. It's just called the trials of life. They're unfortunately common to the human experience. But I want to uh, call your attention to a particular phrase in verse 6. I want you to notice in verse 6 of 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, notice... He said, though now for a season. Everybody say for a season. Most often, the pressures of life, the adversities of life, the challenges of life, what we call perhaps the hardships at times, they tend to come in seasons. No one should be living in crises all the time. I mean, if you're always in a crisis, there's just something wrong with your approach or response to life. Or, you know, maybe you're just a person given to drama. You ever seen a guy, I mean, a person that's, man, they're just dramatic by nature. Everything's a crisis. Those guys tickle me. You know what I'm saying? Kind of entertaining. But no, none of us should live in crises all the time. But there are seasons of adversity, seasons of opposition, Seasons where it, it seems as though things tend to intensify. Are you with me? 
Uh, as a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, he had those times. He recorded them as a man, as a minister, as a, a pioneer of the gospel, and just living in a, in a world that, once again, is in a state of degeneration. He had those, those times and seasons of opposition. Anyone that's serving God, attempting to do God's will, His purpose, His plan, you, you can bet on it, there'll be opposition. So over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9, Notice Paul's comment, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. He said, we are, everybody with me on the scriptures? Guys, I want to wait till they get it up there. 2 Corinthians, all right? Chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, we are troubled on every side. <laughs> now notice, have you ever noticed that most often trouble seems to come with company? Are you listening? You know, adversities seem to arise on multiple fronts, not just one thing, but it seems like several things tend to converge simultaneously. I call it the devil's pile-up technique. Trying to overwhelm you, get you discouraged, right? But I want you to notice Paul's mentality. He said, hey, we're troubled on every side, yet what? not distressed. He said, I'm not going to allow these external pressures, adversities, and the, the external noise that we all experience in life to penetrate my internal peace and joy. He said, I've got some stuff going on, yet not distressed. Not going to get all stressed out about it. <laughs> right? He said, perplexed, how many of you know what perplexed means by definition? Anybody? Perplexed means confused. Paul said, listen, I don't always understand why everything happens the way it does. Why situations and circumstances unfold the way they do. Why people behave and respond the way they do. He says, I don't understand it all. I can't always wrap my head around everything. But just because I can't understand it all doesn't mean I'm going to throw in the towel, lay down, get frustrated, and put up my hands and say, what's it all worth anyhow? He said, perplexed. What's the next word? But... Not in despair. Everybody say, but. He went on to say, persecuted. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, the Bible says. Persecuted, what's the next word? But not forsaken. Woo! You're not forsaken. God said in Hebrews chapter 13, 5 and 6, he said, hey, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless or forsake you or let my, uh, relax my hold upon you or let you down. Assuredly not. So that we can boldly and confidently say, the Lord is my helper. Woo! I'll not be seized with alarm. So Paul said, persecuted but not forsaken. And then he went on to say, cast down. Anybody ever felt cast down? What's the next word? But not destroyed. Woo! I think some Christians need a but revelation. And I'm not talking about the part we're sitting on this morning. I'm talking about the conjunction. But the psalmist said in Psalm 30 and verse 5, he said, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Psalm 34 and verse 10 says, the young lions may lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want for any good thing. Verse 19 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. And of course, John 16 and 33, uh, where Jesus said, hey, in this world now, you're going to have some stuff to deal with, but be of good cheer. 
I've overcome. Hey, I got some good news for you this morning. If you're a Christian and you're sitting in this room today, this is as bad as it gets for you. <laughs> you say, well, it seems pretty, pretty bad. I know, but guess what? It's as bad as it gets. Now, not so for the unbeliever, but for the Christian. You got heaven after this. Eons upon eons in the presence of God. The glories of God. Don't sweat the bumps in the road. It's going to be all right. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need a butt revelation. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you need a butt revelation. <laughs> Woo. Listen. Paul had adversity. Paul had opposition. Paul had hardships in life. We're going to have opposition and adversity. But the good news is, here's the good news. None of it stopped him. None of it overcame him. None of it will stop you. None of it will overcome you. None of it will stop me nor overcome me. Listen. If, if. We will maintain the proper mentality in our seasons of adversity and opposition. Because, friends, listen, the highest form of human captivity is a wrong mentality. I said the highest form of human captivity is a wrong mentality because if I am thinking improperly, then I'm believing improperly. And if I'm believing improperly, then I'm powerless to change my situation. So we understand that we must, as, as believers, we must face life. Whatever may come with a certain predisposition, an internal attitude and mentality that says, Christ in me, Christ with me, Christ for me is more than enough to put me over in any situation. I love the Apostle Paul's, what we call his mentality, his spiritual and mental attitude. We would call it a spirit of faith. Have you ever noticed in Romans chapter 8, verse 35, notice what he says? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Verse 37, nay. King James sounds like a donkey. But in, in English, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us or loved us. And then he goes on to say, for I am persuaded. I am persuaded persuaded. I'm absolutely confident in the fact and the reality that nothing, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Woo! Man, if that doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet this morning. We used to say, if that doesn't ring your bell, your clacker's broke <laughs> or broken. <laughs> if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can be our foe when God is on our side? So, this mentality of faith. And of course, you understand here, there's not only the mentality of faith. But with that mentality of faith, there must also be what we call the vocabulary of faith. Not only the mentality, but the declaration. Amen? Believing God's word, thank God for that, but also declaring its reality is very essential in navigating your seasons of adversity successfully and coming out victoriously on the other side. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13, notice what the apostle Paul said. 
He said, we having the same spirit of faith, and this is what the spirit of faith looks like. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed. Well, that's good. I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. The reality is faith is never silent in the midst of opposition. Faith has a voice. And believing God's promises and declaring their reality even in the face of a seeming contrary reality is very important to navigating that season successfully and once again coming out victoriously on the other side. So faith will always be in two places. It will be in the heart and it will be in the mouth. If it isn't in both places, it's not going to be working for us uh, as proficiently as possible, right? So, you know, what is our pres uh, prescription for uh, navigating these seasons? And maybe you're in one. Believe the Word of God and declare its reality. You must believe that greater is He that is in you than He that is in this world. You must believe that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am ready for. I am equal to anything that comes my way through Christ who infuses his inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. You must believe you are the head. You are not the tail. You are above. You are not beneath. You are blessed coming in. You are blessed going out. That no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment shall be shown to be in the wrong. You must believe that Christ has redeemed you from the curse of the law. You must believe that when you pass through the water, he'll be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overtake you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Neither will the flame kindle upon you. You must believe when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Woo! You must believe his word. And I know you do. But in conjunction with that believing, it must be declared. Because those words help us successfully navigate through those seasons. Amen. Here's the good news, man. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. What does the Bible tell us? Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Well, thank God for that. But continue. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. So here's the good news. Your faith in God and my faith in God can never be equal by its opposition. Nothing can overcome the ability of faith in God. No test or trial. We're going to come out successfully. One way or the other. <laughs> Amen. Now in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, I understand the context of the verse. But I want to set forth the principle. Of course, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Now, once again, I understand the context, but I do want to bring out this point. Sometimes, friends... The most difficult roads lead to the most beautiful places. Sometimes your greatest seasons of blessing, of increase, of success, of advancement, of forward momentum can be preceded by some of the most intense seasons of resistance and opposition and uh, seemingly, uh, you know, despair. I always tell people some of, your, some of your greatest seasons of opposition just might be the border to your promised land. <laughs> you 
you want to what? Man, you want to keep on pressing. Don't let the devil talk you into sitting down, giving up, quitting. Amen? For the joy that was set. And so that's when we have to do what the Bible says, James chapter 1, verse uh, 2 and 3 or somewhere around in there, where he says, hey, count it all joy. It doesn't necessarily feel joyful at the moment. But what did he do? He said, count it joy. Why? Because you know something. You know this test is going to be my testimony. This present opposition will be my future launching pad. God wants to encourage somebody in here this morning. Nothing is impossible with God. As Olivia said, God can take seemingly impossible situations and he can what? Turn them around. Now, many times we coin these phrases, the God of the turnaround. And you know, because we coin them and use them, it can lose its significance. And yet, that is a very biblical principle. How many of you believe God can turn seemingly hopeless situations around? Absolutely he can. You know, when you think about what uh, the definition of a turnaround is, what is that? Well, a turnaround is what we call a change in the course of direction. So perhaps things have been going in a particular course that have been very unfavorable, challenging, right? Adverse. But then, man, what are you? You're thinking properly. You're believing properly. You're telling God you believe in, in His promises. I will say of the Lord, you are my refuge. You are my fortress. You are my God. In you I will trust. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength. Instead of talking all the other junk. You see what I'm saying? He can come in the midst of a seemingly impossible situation. Man, he can bring a 180. A change in the course of direction. Is that scriptural? Absolutely. In Psalm 126 in verse 1. Now please, I understand that Christ has already turned our captivity through his death, burial, and resurrection from a legal standpoint. I'm talking about certain situations in this room this morning. Man, you need to see a turnaround in your situation and you need it expediently and you've been standing your ground man you've been praying and calling out to God he's aware of the situation he's heard the prayers now we're going to activate something this morning is this a scriptural concept Psalm 126 verse 1 when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion we were like them that dream Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Notice, when the Lord turned again. Well, some people say, yeah, but I messed up again. Well, he'll turn it again. again. (laughs) He's merciful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turned again. What does it look like when God supernaturally, by his spirit, you know, he is a supernatural God. What does it look like when God supernaturally turns a situation? Well, the children of Israel were in Egyptian bondage. They were slaves in Egypt. They were poor. They were oppressed. They were downcast. They were probably, you know, sad, like people under oppression would be. And the Bible says, man, God turned that thing. Woo! What does it look like when he turns something? Well, Psalm 105, 37. In one day, notice... He brought them forth also with silver and gold. And there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Are you listening this morning? I know some of you are sitting there and you're saying to yourself, or maybe the enemy's saying to you, oh, I've heard this before. I've prayed and I'm still in the same situation. Stand up on the inside this morning. Renew your faith, draw a line in the sand, and get ready to activate something. 
Psalm 105, 37, he brought them forth with silver and gold. There was not one feeble person among their tribes. Psalm 105 and 43, notice, he brought forth his people with joy and with gladness. You might be here this morning, man, you've been depressed, oppressed. You can walk out of here a different way. Things can be different. You didn't just come to church to sit there. Came to be touched by God. Amen. To be encouraged to activate with your faith something that maybe needs to, to happen and to occur. So the reality is God radically altered their state of existence. And I always tell people never assume for a moment that your present state or circumstance has any bearing on your future potential or fulfillment. Because God can change things in a moment of time. Do you believe it? The Bible says in Job 42 in verse 10, once again, just another example, that God turned the captivity of Job. Man, things look bad. I mean, it was complex. It looked impossible. It looked like it was over. But the Bible says, hey man, God stepped in. Boom, turn that thing around. And although he had lost everything, God is a God of restoration. The Bible says he gave him back not only what he had, but twice as much as he had lost. See, don't allow yourself to become hardened to things that maybe you've heard over and over again through the years. They're still reality. Say, God can turn my situation around. And I believe... He is. I don't care this morning if you feel like you've been in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel chapter 3. We've all been there. Maybe you feel like you've been in the lion's den. You ever read that story in, in, in Daniel? Daniel in the lion's den? The interesting thing about Daniel was Daniel was doing everything right. See, sometimes people think, man, I'm coming to church. I'm coming to prayer. You know, I'm trying to be faithful in my service. I'm trying to be diligent with my finances. I'm doing everything I know to do. And look where I am. Hey, Daniel was doing everything right. And he found himself in a difficult and precarious situation. And don't you know when they came to take him by the arms to drag him to that lion's den? Don't you know that he just knew God was going to zap them? But he didn't. And they took him to the edge of that den, and he's standing on the edge. And I'm sure that Daniel thought just like I have, and I, I, I think you probably have at times, and I've actually said it. Hey, if you plan on doing something, now would be a marvelous time. Have you ever felt like that? I know I have. Hey, you plan on doing something, now would be a great time. But hey, he didn't. They threw him in, and he's in the lion's den. And that's where a lot of Christians give up. I've done everything I know to do, and here I am in the den. But friends, you got to read the rest of the story. Because the Bible says in chapter 6 and verse 23 in essence, says in the morning they came and took him up out of the den. And what? There was no manner of hurt upon him. No manner of hurt upon him. God can so deliver you and deliver me that there is no evidence of the fact we were ever in that den. No residue. Man, you might feel like you're standing at the Red Sea tonight. Dear Lord, the water's in front of you. Pharaoh's breathing down your neck this morning. I got some good news for you. You're going to come, going to pass or come up out of that fire. You're going to come up out of that den. There'll be no manner of hurt upon you. 
They're going to pass through this present sea of opposition and that which God has planned and purposed for you will come into fruition. Do you believe it? Now I know I've spoken to you through many years and probably shared things multiple times. You tend to repeat yourself. God does repeat himself. Did you know the devil repeats himself? Multiple times with the intention of you listening, getting all blue about it, right? But you know, I was going through a tough season in life. I mean, I have to live this like everybody. Sometimes I wonder if it's not more intense. I don't know. But I mean, we go through things, right? And man, I was going through a season of adversity. And I was calling out to God. And the Lord speaks to me in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And, I, I, and he spoke this, this psalm to my heart. And I'll just give it to you because it'll encourage you. He said, you've been in a season of opposition. The enemy has attempted to discourage and detour, get you off track, see. But be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and remain steadfast and endure. Why? Because the tide is turning. The day of victory is near. The devil is defeated. Do not be discouraged and do not fear. For the hopes that you've harbored, the dreams you've believed, they shall come into fruition and they shall be received. So rejoice. And lift your voice and say, God will always get your mouth. Lift your voice and say, things are turning around in my favor. That's what he told me. Victory's mine today. I got up off my knees in my man cave. And I said, hey, devil, things are turning around in my favor. Victory's mine today. It didn't look like it. It didn't feel like it. (laughs) But I kept saying it because the Holy Ghost said say it. When I went to bed at night, thank you, Lord, things are turning around. In my favor. I'd wake up in the morning. Thank you, Lord. Things are turning around. In my, what was I doing? Activating my faith. And praise God, I can give you testimony. It has done so and did do so. Right? And I want to encourage you. Everybody say, things are turning around. Things are turning around. In, my favor. in my favor. Now, Lillian B. Yeomans, how many of you have ever heard of Lillian B. Yeomans? Lillian B. Yeomans was a medical doctor in the early 1900s. Uh, She was uh, unfortunately addicted to morphine, uh, but she was radically saved and delivered and then had a healing ministry for about 40 years. And uh, she made this statement. You've heard it before, but it bears repeating. She said, praise hastens victory. Praise hastens victory. There's something, friends, about praising God before I see the answer, but I know he's heard me. Before I see the turnaround, before I see the manifestation, there's something about praising God that tends to activate his power, his word, his action On our behalf. Is that scriptural? Absolutely. Look over in 2 Chronicles. And this this is our last uh, series of scriptures. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. How many of you give me five more minutes? Anybody? 5, 10, 15, 20. All right. Praise the Lord. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And let's begin reading in, of course, uh, verse 12. Let me give you a little background. Now in chapter 19. Uh, Jehoshaphat, or Jehoshaphat as my children would correct me. They've watched those uh, little DVDs. What do you call them? Uh, uh, What's in the Bible with Buck Denver? Anybody ever seen those DVDs for kids? They're awesome. But Jehoshaphat was rebuked by the prophet Jehu for, you know, erring from God's commandments concerning the nation of Judah and and his worship and so forth. So Jehoshaphat uh, makes amends. Gets things in order. He's doing what's right. Things are going well. Uh, you know, and all of a sudden, man, he has a couple of guys come in with a bad report. They said, King Jehoshaphat, listen, we got a problem. 
A large army east of Edom has arisen. And they're already over the borders of our land and they've reached the En Gedi. And it is massive. Have you ever had a bad report come out of nowhere? And of course, man, it takes him off guard. He initially has fear. And notice what he says in verse 12. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? We have no might against this great company that comes against us. Neither know we what to do. But our eyes are on you. Man, when you don't know what to do, that's a good place to keep your eyes. I don't really know what to do, Lord, but I want you to know I'm trusting you. I'm looking to you. I'm listening for your leadership. And my eyes are on you. Verse 15, of course, the Holy Spirit came upon Gehaziel. He began to prophesy by the Spirit of God. And the Lord said, Harken ye all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed. If you're in this room this morning, maybe the Holy Ghost is talking to you. I know it looks serious. I know it looks impossible. Be not afraid nor dismayed. By reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Woo! Then, of course, he gives them instruction. You go down tomorrow, you engage and move toward uh, uh, this army. Verse 17. You shall not need to fight in this battle. See, sometimes we try to do things in the flesh. It's not going to work. You got to do things in the spirit. Let God fight the battles. We do our part. He does his. It's not all God and it's not all me. There's the, the Godward and the manward that work together. But he said, you'll need, not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. Stand still. Peace this morning. Peace to you. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow you go down against them, for the Lord will be with you. Then, of course, the Bible tells us in the last sentence of the 19th verse, it says that they all stood up and they began to praise God in a very teeny tiny quiet little voice. Is that what it says? No, man. They stood up and they began to praise God in a loud voice. Sometimes you got to mean business. Let every devil. Where are we? Dade County? What county are we in? Miami. Miami. Let every devil in the county hear us. Let him know you mean business. Well, I just resist you, Mr. Devil. I resist you. That ain't going to get the job done. Stand up on the inside. Tell him where to go. Out the door, right? <laughs> Out the door. Off your kids. Off your body. Off your finances. Off your job security. Ooh. So anyway, so they go down, verse 21. They're, they're heading in that direction. And when Jehoshaphat, he, had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they uh, went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Don't you know there were a lot of choir members missing that, that morning? Mr. Jehoshaphat, my throat's bothering me. I mean, they put the choir, the singers, out in front of the people with the, with the weapons. So here they are, man. They're the praise team. Woo! God said, hey, put the praisers out front. <laughs> I said there's power in praise. Praise hastens victory. They begin to praise God in verse 22, notice. And when, everybody say when. when. Not before, friends. 
when. It's as though they had the gun loaded and then they pull the trigger. When they begin, not before, when. When they begin to sing and to praise, the Lord sent ambushments against the children of Ammon and Mount Seir, and which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. Now listen, here's the beauty of this. They begin to praise God in faith because, friends, there was a mountain range in between them and the host of Edom. They could not see their enemy. But what they did was they obeyed God. They started praising God over here for the victory. And simultaneously, God started doing something over there. This morning... We're going to praise God in this house with a loud voice. We're going to start praising him here. And we're going to expect him to start doing something over there. In your situation, in your household, in your family, in your kids. Praise hastens victory. Are you ready to pull the trigger this morning? I know we've said it before and you've heard it before, but there is a premise here. My celebration and your celebration is a demonstration of our faith in the fact God's heard our prayer. The answer's on the way. Things are turning around. And I'm going to praise Him in advance. Are you listening? Now I'll tell you the first step to turning around. That's to get saved. If you're in this house this morning and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, uh, at the end of the service, Pastor Stan's going to give you that opportunity or you can just do it right where you're seated. Say, Jesus, save me. That's simple. Woo! You need to get saved, right? Get into a new kingdom. People say, oh, we're all God's children. No, we're not. There's two families in this earth. All people were created by God, but not all people belong to him or to his family. In order to enter that family, you've got to be born into that family. And the way you're born into that family is believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Woo! And what happens? You shall be saved. So you're going to make sure you have that opportunity. But now listen, everybody stand up. Brother Tracy, I'm going to switch mics. He's the Lord. Thank you, Lord. And here's what we're going to do now. On the count of three, I just want you to get in your mind's eye something that you've been praying about. You need that thing to turn and turn now. I want you to get it in your mind, and I want you on the count of three, we are going to shout in this house just to shout. No, we're going to praise him. Thank him in advance. He's heard us, right? He's working, and it's going to turn around. Now, I like it cranked up, so Brother Tracy's going to crank it up. Are you ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah! He's about to turn some things around He'll lift us up and take us up to higher ground You're not defeated We're not, not going, going down. down God is about to turn some things around Come on God is about to turn some things around He's gonna lift us up and take us up to higher ground some things around. Listen now. We're not looking to the past anymore. We're girding up. We're gearing up. We're going through a brand new door. Things are going to get better than they've ever been before. God is right now turning things around. Come on. Shout a little bit. God is about to turn some things around. Woo! Gonna lift us up and take us up to higher ground. God is 
are about to turn some things around We're seeing an increase of the spirit and the power Mighty signs and wonders being wrought in this hour No failure any longer God's church is getting stronger God is about to turn some things around Come So don't let go of your faith It will soon become sight Just open your mouth and confess the word Everything's gonna be alright This is the time of victory Your turnaround is here God is right now turning things Somebody ought to get happy Anybody gonna dance with me? Anybody gonna shout with me? Some things around. He's about to turn some things around. He's about to turn some things around. Gonna lift us up and take us up to higher ground. We're not defeated. Not going down. God is about to turn some things around. You're not defeated. You're not going down. No. No, God is right now. about to turn some things around. Well, somebody ought to shout a little bit in here. Woo! Glory to God. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Woo! He's turning it around. Right now, he's turning it. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you. This is not mere emotionalism. This is praise. And our praise is activating your power this morning on our behalf. I expect miracles, Lord. I expect miracle testimonies of things turning around in these lives. In the name of Jesus. Everybody shouted amen. Amen. God is good. Well, I'm going to turn this back to Pastor Stan. I tell you, you guys are the most awesome body. Stick with it. It's good. It's good. Glory to God. We're going to turn something. God's turning some things around right now, isn't he? Hallelujah. We're going to do something that he wants us to do. He wants us to bless the ministry of Marty Blackwelder. So... Please be seated. Don't leave if you don't have to. This is a very special moment. God's about to double some things in your life. He's going to give you twice as much as you had before. Glory to God. And we're going to receive now. Ushers, please pass out an envelope to God's people and all who are going to participate with us this morning. Glory to God. What a word. Father, we thank you. We receive it. And we act on it, and we will continue to act on it. In Jesus' name. If you're making out a check, make it out to Words of Life. If you're giving cash, desire a receipt for your giving, please make sure you receive the envelope. Fill it out. Wow. Isn't the Lord good? Praise the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. The glory of God is here, church. You just receive everything you need in Jesus' name. All right. Everybody good? Everybody good? All right. Don't leave if you don't have to. This is a very special moment. Or if you do have to leave, just make sure you place something in the bucket on the way out. Glory to God. Let's hold up that seed right now. Father. We thank you for this seed. We thank you for your blessing upon it. We thank you that your blessing makes everyone in this room rich and you had no sorrow with it. Thank you that this is our covenant right and privilege as a child of God. And Lord, now we sow this seed into the ministry of Marty Blackwelder 
so that he may fulfill your plans, your purposes, and your pursuits for his life and complete every assignment. Father, I ask that from this congregation, partners join him. I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. And as we give, thank you, Lord, for multiplying this seed sown for the glory of God. We're not going down. God is about to turn some things around. Go ahead, sing it while you're doing it. God, God is about to turn, turn some things around. around. Come on now. We lift us up and take us up to higher ground. Ooh, I need Barty to sing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely need Marty to sing. <laughs> you know the words? God is about to turn some things around. God is about to turn some things around. Gonna lift us up and take us up to higher ground. Now, he's about to turn some hearts around here in the mighty name of Jesus. If you've never called on Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if you've never made him the Lord of your life, this is your moment. The Bible says today is the day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. You say, how do I get born again? It's so simple, just like Marty described. You believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And with your own mouth, you confess him as your Lord and Savior. If there's anyone here who's never done that, do it right now with me. And if you've already have, do it again for the glory of God. And I speak specifically now to that one or two or three or whoever it may be who's not sure if they've ever been born again, this is your moment. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. Lift your hands to heaven. Close your eyes for a moment. And say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Come into my heart. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. I believe in my heart God raised you from the dead for my justification. So I boldly declare that I am saved. I am yours. I belong to you, Father God. You are now my Father. I call you my Father. Father, Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for my Savior. Thank you for my Lord. I will follow him. And I will follow you, Lord, all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. And if you made Jesus the Lord of your life, you just come and visit with us. We want to we minister to you further. Are you glad that you came to the church today? Are you glad for the gift that God sent to us today? Well, let me add this before we go. Not only is today's CD going to be available, but if you weren't here on Friday night, you need to get Friday nights too. Because Brother Marty was ministering on the great revival that we are in right now and about end times. And you want to hear what God is doing throughout the earth. It was amazing. Let's just worship him just for a moment before we go. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for every person who is saved today. We thank you for every new birth that took place in their hearts today. Now I need to do something. If that's you, if you 
have been born again. This is the first time you made Jesus the Lord of your life. In other words, you know without a shadow of doubt, you went from death unto life today. You, that you were born again. Jesus wants you to acknowledge that. And we want to connect with you. So I'm going to ask you to do something really bold from your seat today. If you made Jesus the Lord of your life, today if you know for sure that you went from death to life and you were born again, I want you to acknowledge that in the presence of God and in the presence of this great congregation as well. Would you just raise your hand if anyone here got born again? That person who got born again today, would you just raise your hand? Anyone? You need to acknowledge it. You need to acknowledge it. So I must be speaking to a whole bunch of born again people, right? Yes, I don't see any hands up. But I just knew I had to do that in my heart. Because we want, because one thing I want you to know, when you get born again in this church, we're going to connect with you. We're not going to leave you alone. We are, in other words, we're not going to bother you. But what I'm trying to say is, because you got born again here, we're going to make sure you grow up here. We're going to make sure that, 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 that people will be there for you and help you as you begin this new life in Christ. So if I'm talking to anybody in this room and you want to come up and see me after service, let us know so that we can connect. We, we don't just let babies be born and then throw them out the door. We don't do that. You know what I'm trying to say there? No, we all need to grow. And that's why we bring in great ministers like Marty Blackwelder, so we can all grow together in Christ. And everybody said, amen. Let's give, let's all say this. Say, thank you, Lord, for Brother Marty. Thank you for the gift that is in him. And Lord, in these last days, we thank you for multiplication in his life and ministry in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Are you glad you came to church today, church? Glory to God. Well, come and worship some more if you'd like. The altar is open. We love you, Father. We love you, church. And we'll see you and greet Marty on the way out. Go to buy his book table. And also, Olivia is there as well, signing books and, and, and making available her book as well, all for the glory of God. We love you, church, and we'll see you at our next service. God bless you, everybody. Have a great day. Things have turned around for you. Keep praising them in Jesus' name.